Hello and welcome. We are the Restore Consulting Group, and with me today are my colleagues, Chelsea Chilcott, our community liaison, Mariah Crewell, our outreach coordinator, Kendall Hallstrom, our financial advisor, and I'm Cassidy Simmons, our project manager. And we are here today to discuss the opioid crisis in West Virginia and our plan, which offers solutions to the problems seen in Beth and George's cases. On the agenda for today, we'll review the challenge you have tasked us with. We will give a brief review of Beth and George's stories and the problems we identified, which have led to our recommendations of our care plan and what the plan entails. We will provide a financial analysis along with a timeline for implementation of our plan. And finally, we will put into perspective how our plan can provide positive outcomes to situations similar to Beth and George's. So our challenge was to develop new initiatives and new ways of organizing the current initiatives in order to reduce opioid use and overdose rates in West Virginia. So to accomplish this task, we identified the community needs to include those of the stakeholders. We saw a need for better resource accessibility for all parties involved, a need for improved patient and provider education, and a need for increased individualized care, all to improve patient-centered care. Now let's review Beth and George's stories. And as we do, I want you to think about if their stories remind you of someone you know. Meet Mrs. Bethany Giordi, or better known as Beth to friends and family. Beth suffered a back injury after falling off of a ladder. And after one year of conservative treatment, along with an opioid prescription, Beth still experienced chronic pain. Soon after her injury, Beth's husband was diagnosed with cancer and passed away. Now Beth is living completely alone with her closest family being 90 miles from her. With the events of not being able to work due to chronic back pain and, the, and her husband's recent death, Beth experienced increases in depression and anxiety, which contributed to an increased opioid dependency. Then one night, Beth was found face down in her front yard after having overdosed on opioids, alcohol, and benzodiazepine. And after receiving acute care treatment for the overdose, Beth declined further treatment due to a lack of health insurance financial insecurity, and a fear of persisting chronic back pain once opioid treatment was no longer an option. Now meet Mr. George Garrison. George lives alone and is well known in his community. And even though his family lives nearby, George fears that his children and grandchildren will move away due to the recent financial downturn in their community. George has a history of depression and PTSD that is never identified by healthcare providers, along with a history of chronic pain. And two years ago, George was in a car accident where he lost his wife and his chronic pain became uncontrollable, which led to the start of his opioid use. More recently, George experienced an ankle injury, which resulted in many torn ligaments. George became more depressed and increased his daily use of opioids and alcohol. Soon after the injury, George was found dead in his home after having overdosed on opioids, alcohol, benzodiazepine, and heroin. Now this map shows where Beth and George reside in relationship to their available resources. And as you can see, people living in these rural areas of West Virginia have decreased access to sufficient resources for substance use treatment. And recent research shows that West Virginia has higher drug overdose mortality rates compared to the US average. And in 2016, West Virginia had greater than 880 deaths from opioid overdose alone. And according to Gallup Healthways, 2016 State of Wellbeing Rankings, West Virginia ranked number 50 out of 50 states for quality of life in the following categories, meaning their residents had the lowest scores for things such as being in supportive relationships and having pride in their communities. So using this information, we've designed a holistic approach in order to improve the quality of patient care in response to the opioid crisis in West Virginia. In our root cause analysis, we've identified rural communities having decreased accesses, access to resources, and an increased stigma associated with substance use along with depression and other mental health disorders. For our patients, there is a lack of family or social support as well as a lack of financial and other resources to seek treatment. And for our healthcare providers, there is limited education on pain treatment and substance use treatment as well as a lack of support or guidance to provide medication-assisted therapies. So these problems have led to a decrease in the quality of patient care. So our recommendation is care, community, advocacy, resources, and education. Our care plan was developed from the quadruple aim model and it addresses reduced costs, provider satisfaction, quality, community health, all in order to provide patient-centered care. 
The first element of our care plan is C for community. We target community through community advisory council, transportation accessibility, as well as local community education sessions. The community advisory council came about because we understand that no one can better know the wants and needs of a community than those who are living in it. So we have come up with this council that will be coordinated by a community coordinator, which is a new paid position. And together they will target the wants and needs of the community to, and collaborate to make sure that those are addressed. We would like to have an interdisciplinary approach to this council and would want the input from a physical therapist, a pharmacist, a physician, a dentist, among many other disciplines. We also understand there are other stakeholders in the community that are outside of the healthcare realm. This could be someone currently in treatment or maybe someone who's still struggling or a family member who has been affected personally by this opioid crisis. We also target transportation accessibility. There are similar areas to Dinsford County in West Virginia that currently have buses and shuttles provided by their senior center. We want to expand on this and how it targets opioid treatment specifically. The way we do this is through transportation passes. So people that are currently enrolled in treatment, we would have free or reduced rides to and from that treatment. This is great as it decreases dependence on family members and increases overall independence, which is important when considering patient-centered care. We also look at local community education sessions. A lot of times in rural areas, people do not feel they have adequate resources or information when enrolling for insurance. So we would like to show insurance webinars at specific times and in community buildings. We, to answer further questions, we would have a liaison available. And this would be someone that would ideally be a social worker who is already employed with a local agency. We also understand that webinars could be used for other things rather than just insurance specific. And we can use them as a in support and informational tool for families who may not have that readily available in their community right now. Also in our care plan, we have A for advocacy. We target this through stigma reduction and the lead model in policing. Stigma surrounds substance use, and it is very important when considering a state like West Virginia on how can we reduce that. So West Virginia's early intervention plan came out of this year, and they also target stigma reduction. So this is great. The parameters are set for us, and we can expand on it locally. So this will include commercial, print advertisement, and publicity, which locally should be shown in libraries, your physician's office, any kind of community building where stigma can potentially surround. We also need to change our words and our attitudes. When, when talking about someone, calling them an addict really internalizes the problem and we need it to be an externalized thing that, is, uh, that the community comes around to support it. Excuse me, we would rather like to use the words um, substance abuse disorder or substance use or any kind of variation along that line. There's also the lead model in policing which was also written into West Virginia's early intervention plan of this year. It's in a few counties in West Virginia, but it is our plan to make sure it is in all of them. So what this is, is when we are training our police officers that when they in encounter someone who's under the influence of substance use or any kind of narcotic drug, rather than detaining them and criminally charging them, we're actually referring them to services. And this promotes sustained recovery for that individual as well as the community, because that individual does not have that criminal charge adversely affecting their job and their family, and the community has members who have a longevity of going to treatment. <coughs> the next element of our care plan is R for the resources that we want to bring to these communities, which will include an online prescription tracking program, groups, and Narcotics Anonymous. The Controlled Substances Automated Prescription Program, or CSAP, is an online prescription tracking tool that allows healthcare providers to access patient-specific prescription data, such as the types and number of medications being prescribed to these patients, which is essential when monitoring for substance use disorder. This tool can be used by all healthcare providers, but one problem we noted in the stories of Beth and George is that in these small rural towns, they occasionally have internet outages, which means providers cannot access this online tool. So in order to reconcile this problem, we consulted with a representative from CSAP and decided on a solution to expand the use of their helpline so that providers can simply call in to CSAP and receive this patient prescription data over the phone. Groups is an organization that has developed a new approach to medication-assisted therapy. Groups focuses on the two main barriers that these rural communities face, proximity and price, by building low-cost clinics in small rural towns. 
Groups uses Suboxone for its medication-assisted therapy. Suboxone can be prescribed by many healthcare providers, including physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and is a low-cost prescription. This is in contrast to the more traditional methadone clinics that require daily trips to the clinic to receive the highly regulated methadone therapies. Groups also takes a more holistic approach to substance use and focuses on creating com a community of support for these individuals. As our patients transition off of the Suboxone therapy and out of the group's model, we hope to immediately integrate them into the larger community of Narcotics Anonymous. NA is a well-established peer support network that also emphasizes the importance of community as well as improving overall quality of life for its members, focusing on areas such as building relationships and accountability. One potential barrier we noted with NA is that according to their website, only 14% of their members are over the age of 60. So as we create these Narcotics Anonymous groups for these small rural towns, we want to make sure that they're both inviting and inclusive of older adults like Beth and George. The final element of our care plan is E for education. We will improve the education of both our healthcare providers and our community, as well as implement the use of well-established healthcare screenings. First, for our healthcare professionals. We want to emphasize alternative pain management strategies that can include the use of a variety of specialties such as physical therapists, chiropractors, mm -hmm. as well as non-opioid prescription medications. If opioids are indicated for the treatment of a patient's chronic pain, we will provide an online course offered for free through the American College of Physicians that emphasizes safe opioid prescribing practices. We will also ensure that all healthcare professionals are aware of the online prescription tracking program, CSAP, that is already available throughout West Virginia. Next, for our community, we will again emphasize the importance of an interdisciplinary approach to alternative pain management. We will also expand the community's knowledge on the warning signs and symptoms of opioid overdose, so that if they see a friend or family member exhibiting these symptoms, they can seek proper medical care. We also want to provide community members with education on Narcan, an antidote for opioid overdose. Narcan is a low-cost, over-the-counter prescription medication that is easily administered as a nasal spray. If we can expand the knowledge and use of this throughout the community, this could potentially be life-saving for someone who has overdosed from opioids. In fact, just this past week, the United States Surgeon General urged more Americans to start carrying Narcan. Finally, we want to implement two healthcare screenings. The first is the PHQ-9, which is a healthcare screening for depression. Both Beth and George suffered from depression, and as we know, depression can affect many areas of one's life, including how one manages chronic pain. The second is the CAGE questionnaire. This screens for substance abuse, for substances such as alcohol and opioids. We believe if we can implement these well-established healthcare screenings, we can identify these problems early and get treatment to our patients earlier. So now that you've heard all of the elements of our care plan, you're probably wondering who's going to implement all of these. So as you can see, we've outlined a supervisor for each initiative, as well as outcome measurements to determine which elements of our plan are effective and which elements may need adjustment to better serve our community. So for example, under advocacy, the lead model will be supervised by local police departments, and the outcome measurements, which include tracking number of drug-related arrests, have already been outlined in West Virginia's opioid crisis plan for this year. Last year, West Virginia taxpayers spent $8.8 .8 billion on the opioid epidemic. This was dispersed between four categories. Treatment, criminal justice, reduced productivity, and the biggest impact, in more ways than one, overdose. Through our initiative, we not only intend to reduce the number of loved ones lost, but also the economic burden that this crisis is imposing on West Virginia. If you refer to your packet, you'll see a more detailed breakdown of the associated costs and their funding, and right now I'd like to highlight a few of these items. First, we suggest offering $10,000 a year to each county to appoint a community support liaison who will be in charge of the Medicaid webinars and the community support groups. In order to get Narcan into the hands of communities, we'd like to budget $309,000 so that qualified community groups can purchase the Narcan at a discounted rate, making it more affordable and accessible to the uninsured populations. For our lead program, we estimate $4.7 million, which will be paid for through community business partnerships. Um, this will cover the cost of 
treatment, housing, mental health services, and job training. And finally, using an estimate of um, substance abusers in West Virginia, we have the Suboxone medication costs at $9.06 million. This gives us a three-year total of $17.1 million. So who's going to pay for all of this? First, through those community partnerships. And second, through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, grants. Currently, West Virginia receives about $18.9 million for the prevention and treatment of substance abuse. We would simply like to reallocate these funds to cover the more cost-effective um, elements of our plan. So you put in the money, where's the return? First, the top chart shows 200 people incarcerated versus 200 enrolled in the LEAD initiative. Over a three-year period, we expect a savings of $12.3 million. The second chart shows the number of overdoses we would like to prevent in a three-year period. If we're able to do this, we'll save $36 million. Initially, that $17.1 million may have seemed pretty steep for a budget, but when we consider the $8.8 .8 billion that West Virginia is currently spending and the $48 million that we intend to save you through only two of our initiatives, it becomes a little bit more lucrative. We've mapped out our plan for the next three years. In the first year, we would like to distribute pamphlets to the communities and get the community webinars started. In year two, we'd like to get the lead initiative and the groups clinics up and running. And finally, in year three, we'd like to focus on the rural health providers incentive program and the transportation cards to provide services to those who need them. What did we change through the implementation of our plan? First, we provided a rural community with high stigma, reduced stigma, and accessible resources. We gave a patient with limited outside support and resources, patient-centered care, and educational opportunities. And finally, we gave healthcare providers with limited outside support and, re and training, resources, training, and prescription, opioid prescription courses. If our plan had been implemented just a little bit sooner, Beth and George's stories would have had significantly different outcomes. Through the increased community awareness and social support, they would feel confident seeking help. Through the reduced stigma, they no longer feared judgment. Through the increased educational or increased resources, they were aware of um, the financial support they had, making treatment a viable option. And finally, through the education opportunities, the patients, providers, and community members were better able to identify the risk for substance abuse and get them the help they needed significantly sooner. Beth and George have stories of a system that failed them. Through the implementation of our care plan, they now have an improved quality of life free from substance abuse. We'd like to extend a thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation and open the floor for any questions. I really like your focus on community and trying to activate community. Um, toward that end, you described a community advisory council and Alicia description suggested um, a variety of providers, which I thought made sense, so all bringing their professional discipline and, and then uh, potential substance abusers as, as additional players there. It, it strikes me there are a lot of other sectors in the community, broadly the educational sector, the governmental sector, law enforcement, uh, the religious and faith community that all have skin in the game, if that's a reasonable metaphor. Um, if you would, if you'd speak to, you know, where they, what role they all play. You've mentioned police in a couple of different categories, sure. but speak a little bit more to some of these other sectors in the community. I think for time's sake, we only highlighted a few, but if we were to do a community advisory council, it would be important to include every aspect of the community. And what that would look like for each community might differ per county, but I think anyone's input and in, that has a stake in the community should and be involved in that what that would look like may just differ. And for time's sake, that's why we didn't mention them, but absolutely they would be involved. Okay, one more if I can. <laughs> <laughs> um. Nonprofit uh, hospitals and healthcare systems have a community benefit requirement from the IRS. They're supposed to be doing health needs assessments and they're really supposed to be al you know, allocating and focusing resources to areas of high priority. And I guess I can't imagine how much higher priority than, than opioid abuse. So what, where, where, where does that fit in your solution? Uh, 
I think um, that we'll, by focusing on educating everyone on kind of the scope of opioid overdose as well as how many people are being affected by it, that um, I agree with you that, that I can't see a more um, cost effective or um, implementation of how to address those problems. So I think if we can just keep expand everyone's knowledge of the issue, um, as well as implementing these core plans into um, the already established healthcare situations that will approach it from that direction. Yeah. Can you describe uh, what's gonna change for Dr. Jones? He's a solo practitioner, doesn't have an EHR, kind of, if, as you implement all of this, what's gonna change for him? How is he gonna improve his practice? How are you gonna engage him to be part of the solution here? Um, I think if we were to engage him in just the education and understanding that not prescribing such a high level of opioids after maybe surgeries or chronic pain and um, educating his patients on the alternative care um, that we suggested in our plan, um, that that will help to help him understand better options that he may have. Yeah, and I think also expanding like the number of resources that are available to him will help because it's hard to be um, practicing alone in such a small town. So having more resources like the groups, clinics, mm -hmm. the online um, prescription tracking tool, Narcotics Anonymous, more places he can refer patients to um, will also help in his longevity of treatment of those patients. As you guys put together your care CARES model here, did you, what, was, what was your thinking about uh, telehealth and how that could play in here? We recognize that telehealth would be beneficial for these rural areas, especially since they have a decrease in you know, the physicians and the alternative pain management providers. Uh, we haven't included that specifically in this plan we presented to you today, but it is definitely an option that can be incorporated into our care plan. We started more simply you know, working on the kinks and the problems we identified, you know, like the internet outages and the things we can do right away as far as getting more information out to the public. But as we, we also, I don't think we specifically mentioned this, but we also wanna get our physicians, um, you know, more comfortable prescribing those medication assisted therapies. So that could also help with that. But um, for telehealth, like I said, alternative pain management, I think that is something that will come later if we identify that need. It's going to be, you know, a county by county place, seeing what they have and what they don't have. So thank you. Um, you mentioned several times, and it was present in several of the slides about the the um, resource of Narcotics Anonymous. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious how you foresee your consulting group. Um, I'm not sure how to ask this question. Um, without sort of answering it, actually. Um, <laughs> That's okay, too. You mentioned that Narcotics <laughs> Anonymous is a resource. Yes. Um, do you foresee your consulting group somehow working with Narcotics Anonymous to bring about more meetings? Do you understand the role of Narcotics Anonymous and how that organization operates? Yeah, I think that we more see it as if there's communities that don't currently have Narcotics Anonymous groups meeting that we want to make sure that the community is aware of that resource and help bring it to the community. So whether that means con contracting with Narcotics Anonymous or having someone in the community here feels comfortable stepping up and leading that group, because I know a lot of the times that it's recovering or recovered um, Narcotics Anonymous users that have stepped up to be leaders in the community, that that's something we foresee is that the community itself would be kind of a grassroots movement to start those meetings if they feel it would be helpful for their community. Yeah, so typically Narcotics Anonymous, just for your information going forward, because it's a wonderful um, resource for those who want to use it, Narcotics Anonymous is unaffiliated, and so they do not work with outside organizations. All meetings are started by addicts. Um, I did really appreciate your focus on changing the language in stigma reduction. You're going to run into a problem with um, sending people to Narcotics Anonymous meetings where they identify as addicts, but also at the same time attempting to eliminate that language. Um, so that's just something to be aware of, but I really do appreciate that you're uh, recognizing that there are um, individual-led resources out there for support for this issue. So um, just for your information. 
Yeah, thank and you. And to expand on that, I appreciate your comment. Um, I think that well, the reason we put that under advocacy is that if they change the word of addict, maybe they can go into those places like NA and advocate for themselves. Like maybe we could use different language even here. And I think that's the reason we put it under advocacy. That's a good point. I'd like to go back to the funding. Um, the baseline numbers you had there, is that prior to the all the federal dollars that have come in over the last year and a half, the CURES funding, the CARA funding, the 2018 budget? Yes, the like the substance abuse, um, the SAMHSA funding, right. this is from 2016. Okay. And so have you looked at the new funding and whether that would be available for your program? I hadn't, but it said that it um, they just had to reapply for it, and so they may have more funding now. I'm not okay. entirely aware of that, though. So you were talking about effectively reallocation of those dollars, if I understood you correctly. Let's get to something more about activation. We talked a little bit about community activation, and I think you have your, your council that you're talking about that uh, sound like it got bigger as we talked, which is good. Let's talk about getting the, the individuals and, and kind of the, the culture of Appalachia and, and the, the tendency to resist government or imposition and that sort of thing. How, how, would, how would you approach that in a community in terms of trying to get buy-in to these, these various initiatives of yours? I think even if you're considering where West Virginia ranked in quality of life, I think that might be um, a big enough reinforcer for someone to want to, get particip to be participant in this because they're ranked 50 out of 50 for the past five years, and I would want more for my state. And, having a community that is not surrounded by opioid use. So I think that's something to consider and maybe understanding they might have a huge stakehold just in that, fa that fact alone. I also think um, maybe getting a community member that has a voice that's already um, pretty involved in the community will be very helpful. I'm from a small community myself and I know if somebody was to say this person needs help, everyone in that community is going to buy in and help them. And so I think by really getting kind of the the bigger people in the community to buy in is where we'll see everyone buy in, if that makes sense. Is there a role perhaps for the faith-based community where a significant portion of the population you know, does go to church? Do you think there's a role there? I think there's certainly a role um, for faith-based community. All of our care plan was focused on just getting support for individuals. So whatever that support system is for them individually, I know that's very important. For a lot of people, it's their church and it's their community that they've built around that and their different religions. So I think there's definitely a role for that. And to follow along with that, like our plan, we're reaching out to everyone in the community, not just the people who have experienced overdose or who are currently substance users, but you know, the family members, uh, community members that are alongside these people. So we do we anticipate you know, buy-in just from the education and trying to show them how important this is to help out your community member mm -hmm. and how it can improve their community as a whole. Yeah. Okay, I, guess, uh, I have to stop you, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, T1. <laughs> Thank you, T1. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank